an Arduino, a Max 6675 thermocouple to digital module and some software. Uh, that's basically where <laughs> the post bag I showed these modules ended. Card link. And now I want to go a little bit further. So you have uh, some microcontroller, in this case Arduino Nano, preferably not necessarily <laughs> with an SPI interface on it. Uh, you have a Max 6675 module or several of them. Yeah, I want to uh, go into connecting several of these. Uh, so you can read data from several thermocouples. And I also want to talk about a little pitfall concerning thermocouples in general, how using several or at least two thermocouples, you can create a short in your circuit when you're measuring things. Uh, it's actually trivial, but um, sometimes you forget about those things. And yeah, I will have also a little bit more detailed look at that Max 776675 library that uh, is available for the Arduino. And it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit disappointing to say the least. Um, yeah, but uh, let's have first a look at the code and what data we get delivered from that thing. The code is really nothing to write home about. I have defined my three pins, that is the SPI bus master in slave out pin, the SPI bus serial clock pin and my max 6675 chip select pin. Yeah, we have a look at the circuit uh, after that. And I, using that standard or readily available Max 6675 library, I initialize my object with the pins and I initialize my serial data port to, yeah, write back the temperatures I measure to my notebook. Most of the stuff in the main loop you can ignore for now. Um, I have a double value where I store the temperature in. That's another uh, oddity of that library. I have a delay of 500 milliseconds and then I read the temperature from my max module and then I print it out. Okay to the serial port. Uh, the rest you can ignore for now. Um, let's have a look at the circuit. I have my Arduino Nano and my Max 6675 module. And being a good boy, I connected these through the SPI bus pins of the Nano. So we have our serial clock going to the serial clock of the module. We have our master in slave out pin connected to the slave out pin of the module. And I'm using the slave select pin of the Nano to drive the chip select pin or slave select pin. That's the same on a SPI bus of the module. A uh, side note here, if you're using the Nano as an SPI master, you should always, or hmm, other way around, you should never ever define that pin here, the slave select pin, as input. Otherwise, you might fool your Arduino in thinking that it is an SPI slave. So this pin is, of course, an output pin driving the chip select pin of the module. Uh, yeah, 
we have more lines here and there's more stuff there because I said I wanted to connect more than one module later on. And out you get the temperature. Okay, that is probably uh, a little bit small, but uh, yeah. Some numbers with two decimals. In fact, the max delivers you a 12-bit number with the least significant bit equivalent to 0.25 degrees. And uh, yeah, let's have a look at a graph of these numbers. If you have a look at these numbers as curve, you see that it's noisy as hell. Uh, in fact, if the middle line is uh, yeah about 26.75 degrees C, and yeah, you you have here. Uh, I mean, each of these little steps is one LSB. Okay, so you have. Yeah, about four to six LSB noise on the output of that thing, uh, translating to one degree C to 1.5 degrees C noise. So the first thing you see here is um, <clears throat> displaying that data down to the last significant bit makes absolutely no sense. If you look into the data sheet at temperature error uh, for our range between 0 and 700 degrees C at 5 volt supply voltage, we have minus 9 to plus 9 least significant bits of error. So plus minus 2.25 degrees C and uh, yeah, we already said uh, four to six LSBs of that is just noise. So um, yeah, uh, I guess that's the reason uh, that any thermocouple instrument like your multimeter that can accept thermocouples as input for temperature measurements only displays whole degrees and uh, yeah we should do that too. I just added two lines to the code after printing the value itself. I print a tabulator and then the value rounded to the next whole number and that should give us two curves in the plot. And indeed it does. Uh, so I have still my blue curve here. Uh, yeah, noisy as hell. And then I have that curve rounded to full degrees and uh, it's also noisy as hell, you might have guessed. And it's constantly uh, going between 27 degrees C and 28 degrees C. Uh, it's getting warmer here under the roof. Um, yeah, so that's not the solution. What we need is to put an average on our raw data to get the noise out and then we can round it. And that's what I have here. So the red line is a so-called modified moving average, averaging 10 values each time of my raw data and it looks much smoother. And just for demonstration purposes, yeah, at that point I touched my sensor so we can see a raise in temperature and uh, yeah, I let go here and falling again. So I can demonstrate the drawback of using any moving averaging uh, and that is time lag. Yeah. The more elements, in my case 10, you average, the greater the, your time lag between your averaged curve and your actual data becomes. It's a trade-off. Yeah. Make it smoother. Yeah. Greater time lag. 
uh, make it less smooth, shorter time lag. But you always get a time lag. And the formula for that modified moving average, we'll see it in a code in a moment, is to have your new value for the red line, you take your alpha, which is basically your number of elements, uh, one divided by the number of elements you want to average, times your actual value plus one minus alpha, so uh, alpha is 0.1, 10%, that's 90%, times the old value of your moving average. Yeah, So you're not using an array which you uh, fill with 10 elements, which you fill in a round robin way and average each, uh, add up each time each element. You just take the whole of your last sum always and uh, yeah, add the new value with a factor. And in the code, yeah, now the rest uh, becomes relevant. Uh, I have my constant here, which is a float, moving average alpha, which is 0.1. So I'm averaging over 10 values. I have a static value here, my moving average itself, which I initialize the first time I go into the loop with minus 100. And something else worth noise. Yeah, uh, this is the real initialization of my moving average. So the first time around in the loop when the value is still at 100, I initialize my moving average with the actual value. So I have a good starting point and not, uh, yeah, I have, don't have to average. Uh, 10 elements at the start to get to a realistic value. And then I calculate the next moving average. I already showed you the formula. So alpha times my actual value plus one minus alpha times my old value. And yeah, of course, I print that out to the graph. So only thing left to do is to, yeah, round that moving average to the next whole number to get us a uh, yeah, degree Celsius without any decimals. And here I have a plot of a similar measurement. So we are heating up with my finger again and letting it cool down with the green curve being the rounded average value to whole degrees Celsius. And if you would display that on an OLED on LCD or uh, any other output device, you would have a nice steady increase displayed in temperature. So 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, etc. And then going down 35, 34. 30. Yeah, you, you wouldn't have that flatter. Uh, 32, 31, 32, 31, 33, 32, 33, 32, 31, 30. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Now, that was fun, but uh, can't we get more values per second? I mean, uh, two values per second is a little bit slow, so we can decrease the delay, but uh, let's say to our 100 milliseconds, that should be enough. And we upload that. And as soon as it's uploaded, I will open the serial plotter and we have a look at what's happening. So we get a lot more values per second now. The only problem is, uh, can I get that into view? Yeah, that's really, it's my sensor. Nothing is happening anymore. And the answer for that can be found in the data sheet and it's called conversion time. Uh, you can ignore the note that just saying, okay, we don't measure the conversion time of our chips in production. We, uh, yeah, it's uh, guaranteed by the design of the chip. And it's between 170 milliseconds and 220 milliseconds. 
and the Max 6675, as soon as he gets that chip select low signal, it stops whatever value it's converting right now and goes into output mode and simply outputs the last converted value to the serial bus. And of course, if you pull the chip select all 100 milliseconds down, the poor thing never will be able to finish any new conversion, so you get the old value. Um, the difference here is uh, probably caused by the chip internally using some kind of uh, you know iterative uh, analog to digital conversion. So some values uh, it will settle faster than uh, for other values. That should be the worst case. But anyway, 220 milliseconds should be uh, yeah the minimal period we can pull that thing. And indeed if we change our delay to let's say 220 and upload the whole thing again then we should get values every 220 milliseconds plus the time we need for our calculations here. So let's pull up the serial plotter For some reason it's very small and yeah, yeah, you see. We get our nice noise in the blue curve. Yeah, there was even no noise. So uh, it, it really stuck with the last value it had in some register and uh, wrote that again out and out. Uh, yeah. And now we have, uh, yeah, we have even here a very nice case showing that our method is not unfailable. Yeah, we're, we're actually here around uh, 28 and, uh, sorry, 20, yeah, 28 and 29 Celsius. And uh, yeah, we have that, uh, not very nice jitter between two integer values here for our temperature. But uh, I'm touching the sensor now and yeah, works like a treat. Okay, uh, we talk now about yeah conditioning your digital signal, filtering it so you get some uh, values that are easy to read and uh, about how fast we can get some values out of that thing. Next step should be to have two sensors or yeah, three or four or uh, five. And indeed I have now two of these max modules on my board with two different sensors connected. And you can see white is my clock and orange is my data line. These are simply daisy chained uh, between the two boards. Uh, both have a connection to my new, yeah, I use it now, a uh, power bus. And the only additional pin I need is another chip select pin. Okay, let's have a look at the schematics. So indeed my master in slave out is just daisy chained to the slave out of the max modules and so is my serial clock. So the only additional pin as mentioned I am using the digital 9 pin of the Arduino is an additional chip select so that I can select which data from which module I actually want to read. Let's have a look at the code. My initialization code got a little bit more complex. I still have my meso pin definition and serial clock pin definition. 
new I have a constant which stores the number of modules I want to address and my chip select pin variable became a chip select pin array where I store the pins digital 10 and 9 of the chip select uh, for uh, which I use for the chip select blah, blah. and also my max 6675 object became an array of objects which I initialize here and uh, yeah the only difference is uh, the first one got the chip select uh, at the position 0 in the array so 10 and the second one on the position 1 in the array so 9 and yeah uh, why do I have to initialize these MISO and S clock serial clock pins uh, yeah we'll talk about that library later on a little bit more at the end uh, yeah serial begin no problem here um, yeah my loop is simple <laughs> uh, I still have my alpha but now I have an array yeah with two elements for my average these are initialized to minus 100 minus 100 i have uh, my delay it's still there and then i go through zero to one through all my modules i have on the bus first i read yeah the temperature from the first module uh, yeah initialize the moving average for that module calculate the new moving average for that module and then I print it out to the serial port so we can have a look at it and that's all and uh, of course you can extend that to an arbitrary number as long as you have pins left on your Arduino uh, for the chip select line uh, to address whatever, uh, however many uh, modules you have. And indeed, looking at the serial plot, we see we have two different values now. And uh, yeah, I <laughs> just touched the sensor. I can touch the other sensor to heat it up a little bit. And yeah, there we go. nice okay letting that one go and touching the other sensor wonderful so multiple temperatures being measured um yeah and now that we have two of these sensors on the board um yeah, there is a little pitfall, not specific to the MAX module or the Arduino, but to thermocouples in general. Most thermocouples are of the so-called unisolated type, that is the junction where the two metals are welded together is uh, completely exposed or uh, yeah where you connect the sensor is electrically connected to the junction where the two different metals meet and uh, I mean we're talking metal metal and then metal going uh, yeah uh, back to your sensor inputs and uh, yeah I have two of them and yeah, the thing is, <laughs> these sensor chips are not, uh, the outputs are not isolated. In fact, in fact, for the sensor chips to work probably, properly, um, the negative input from the thermocouple has to be connected to ground, power ground. And that means your two sensors here yeah, uh, I have that on ohm. They should be... Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
now basically a shot between the two. And uh, that is bad enough, but it has a <laughs> uh, another effect. If you look at the serial plot, <laughs> that was when I measured the uh, resistance between my two sensors and I can do that again. And you see, yeah, it's not looking good. And if I reverse the polarity between the two, just turning the electrodes around, yeah, then it goes into the other direction. So not only uh, you have, uh, sorry, going back here, uh, not only you have a short, basically a short uh, between your two sensors. Also, if you have only a little voltage difference, yeah, I mean, this is only uh, yeah, a, a few volts here or a few mini volts from the ohmmeter. Uh, if you have a little voltage difference between your two sensors, potential, it will totally screw up your measurements. You need to keep that in mind. I mean, these thermocouples are uh, creating voltages um, in the order of magnitude of millivolts, which are then amplified. So, uh, yeah. And <clears throat> it can also really make for a bad, very bad experience. Let's assume you have an output stage, something like that. I just scribbled that down of an uh, analog amplifier. And uh, yeah, you have the typical NPN, P, uh, PNP, NPN uh, pair transistors yeah, in your TO220 cases. And uh, yeah, case is connected here and uh, case is connected here. And you want to measure the temperatures of both. Bang! You just made a shot here. Um, equally bad, uh, you just have, uh, let's say, a triac or a thyristor, a CR, and you want to measure the temperature and you are uh, very careful about it. Yeah, You just connect uh, one sensor and your other sensor still in your instrument is dangling around in the breeze somewhere. That sensor is now live. If you touch it, goodbye. And so you might say, I will never ever measure such things with uh, some Max and an Arduino. I will always take my brand named, yeah, tested multimeter, yeah, cut for 1000 volts. Um, yeah, I have news for you. I mean, this is a Bryman. It's not the most expensive, but they are reasonably good multimeters and they have also certifications. And uh, yeah, if I connect two temperature sensors to them and... Oh yeah, it's beeping. Sorry. Uh, oh, exactly the same resistance. Hmm. Maybe they're using the Max <laughs> chip for conversion. And, and you also see it goes, uh, yeah, the temperature will just go through the roof. Yeah. And even screw in thermocouples like that might not be of the isolated type. Yeah. This thingy, <laughs> the same problem as the others. Okay, uh, enough about that. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that Max 6675 library that you uh, find uh, within the Arduino environment. The first oddity about that Max 6675 library is that you have to define the clock pin, SPI clock pin, and the SPI meso pin. These pins are fixed in hardware because there is hardware functionality behind them, uh, mainly the SPI interface. So why do you have to define them? Well, the answer is quite simple. <laughs> this library 
does not use the Arduino or at AT Mega in that case SPI interface at all. It does internally bit banging on these pins to yeah, create a clock signal and uh, to read the data back. So um, yeah, what gives? Um, I mean, there's one advantage doing that. Uh, you are not limited on using the dedicated clock pin and the dedicated master in slave out pin on your Arduino. You can connect your Max 6675 to any pins you want to any digital, uh, yeah. Um, but ah, nevertheless, the second thing is uh, that library uses doubles uh, internally. Uh, I mean, we get a 12 bit number from the Max 6675. 12-bit number. Uh, why use a double floating point number? So um, instead let me write some code and utilize the SPI library of the Arduino to actually read values from our little Max chip. And that's in fact the code, uh, first page of it. Uh, it's not much. So uh, instead of using that uh, Max library, I'm using the Arduino SPI library. Um, there are only two constants left. Yeah, my number of Max chips and uh, yeah, the array with the chip select pins. And then I have a new object here, SPI settings, that's from the SPI library, where I define the SPI settings for the max chip. That's a uh, one megahertz maximum SPI clock the thing can eat, uh, most significant bit first, and SPI mode one. Uh, SPI mode defines basically when to read data, uh, on which phase of the clock, on the rising edge, on the falling edge, uh, etc. Uh, setup is a little bit bigger. Uh, we now have to go through all our chip select pins in that loop, set them as output and write a high to them, so disable the chips. Um, yeah, that uh, was done by the other library for us. We need an SPI begin, so we initialize actually the AT Mega SPI hardware and all the pins. Yeah, that's all done in one statement and our serial begin. Our main loop hasn't changed at all, but for the fact that I'm using now a function max 6675 read, which uh, gets as an argument the chip select pin of the max chip I want to read the value from. And uh, yeah, I, I'm returning just a float. I mean, you, you could rewrite that as returning an integer, uh, which gives you the value in quarter degrees of Celsius. Uh, yeah, for this purpose, that was not necessary. And finally, we have this function max 6675 read, which is not complicated at all. Yeah, I have an unsigned int data, so 16 bits I'll get in each transaction from the max chip. I make an SPI begin transaction if you don't, and uh, later on an end transaction if you don't know what that is. Um, the begin transaction gets the SPI parameters specific to that chip because you could have chips which have different use, different SPI modes and different um, yeah, clock speeds on the same SPI bus. And this SPI begin transaction sets the yeah, according SPI parameters and uh, yeah, there's also an end transaction because at the same time it prevents any interrupts yeah, getting into the data transfer uh, because that would be bad. So this is a nice way 
to get SPI data from your device. And uh, yeah, digital write, yeah, the chip select pin to low. So I enable that max chip here. At the end, uh, I write a back to it. So I disable it again so it can do its conversions. And then I do an SPI transfer 16. So I get 16 bits from the SPI bus. And at the same time, uh, yeah, SPI transfer is always 16 bits in from the slave and on the other pin, which is not used by the max, 16 bits, 16 bits out to the slave. But uh, yeah, uh, we don't write anything out, so 16 zeros here. Then I compare data to that um, with the third bit set in the third bit. Yeah, remember the max returns a 12 bit number in 16 bits of data. And the third bit is a flag if no sensor is connected. So if that's the case, I return that's NAN, not a number. Yeah, special number format. Otherwise, I have to shift the data three bits <laughs> to the right because, uh, yeah, my 12 bit data is uh, three bits to the left. So I shift it three bits to the right and because it's in quarter degree celsius 0.25 degrees celsius yeah the least significant bit i divide it by four to get my floating point number and that's all and as you can see it works quite well uh heating up one sensor let's see do we get a reaction yeah there temperature is rising perfect heating up the other sensor yep there we go yeah and uh that's it uh for today about uh yeah arduino max 6675s and where are they power couples Bye.